So good morning, everyone, and welcome again. Uh, today is also a special day, like yesterday. And it is my pleasure to introduce another uh, plenary speaker, Professor Eugen Pozik from the Niels Bohr Institute, scientific director of Danish Center for Quantum Optics, member of Royal Danish Academy of Sciences. Professor Eugen Polzik is an experimental quantum physicist. He graduated from St. Petersburg University, as well as received his PhD at this university. Later on, his world line passed through many universities in the world, in particular, particularly twice passed through California Institute of Technology as an associated scientist and as a more distinguished scholar through Institute for Photonic Sciences at Barcelona as a distinguished invited professor, through University of Aros as a professor of physics, and finally, in 2003, he became a professor at, at the University of Copenhagen, the Niels Bohr Institute. Eugene is a winner, winner of many awards, most notably European Research Council Advanced Grant Award, Gordon Moore Distinguished Scholar Award, Scientific Amer American Research Leadership Award, and Danish Physical Society Prize. Professor Eugen Polzik has a number of breakthrough achievements in the field. In particular, Eugen and his colleagues created a new device in which a tiny membrane convert ultra-weak radio waves to light, thus paving the way for a very prom promising application in the do domain of quantum technologies. He's, he has kindly agreed ac to join us, and today he's, he's going to talk about the measurements a measurement of motion in the negative mass reference frame. Please join me in welcoming Professor Eugen Polzik very warmly. Thank you very much, um, Alekram. Is that on? I'm not sure, but anyway, you can hear me. It's probably yeah. Um, I would like to thank Professor Ali Kramaliev and uh, his colleagues who contributed to organizing this very impressive symposium. And um, on another note, um, I know that it's a special day for Turkey today uh, because of commemoration of uh, Kemal Ataturk. And um, I think in some sense the kind of enlightenment, if I may say, that Ataturk brought to this country was a prerequisition to what we are witnessing today on a smaller scale. So let me get to the point. This is indeed the talk uh, focused on measuring motion beyond standard quantum limits. So we all know and love quantum mechanics, and we know that the position and the momentum are non-commuting variables. They cannot be measured simultaneously. And this, is, this can be written as the uncertainty principle, where the uncertainty, the variance of the position, times the uncertainty, the variance of the momentum, is greater than something in normalized units where vacuum and sent is one half, this should be greater or equal to one fourth. So that's a limitation. For an oscillator in the laboratory frame, you can obviously write it as x times the sine plus p times cosine, x and p don't commute, therefore you cannot measure them simultaneously. So you can think of it kind of in the phasor diagram in the following way. Imagine that at some point in time, when sine is 1, I'm measuring x, obviously, right? So I'm measuring x in the laboratory frame. 
at this moment in time I'm measuring x because this term is zero. While I'm measuring x, I inevitably put the quantum back action of measurement into p. Quarter period later, I am measuring p. But remember, I put the back action into p. Now I'm measuring p and putting the back action in x. And quarter period later, now I have back action in both quadratures. And I keep doing this, keep doing this, and the longer I measure, the more I disturb the system. So obviously, there is a nice balance, which is the balance between the back action of the measurement that I put on this oscillator and the amount of knowledge that I acquire about it. So this golden balance is called the standard quantum limit. And for a free mass, so this is an oscillator, but let's talk for a minute about the free mass. That can be written in relatively simple terms. So the position as a function of time, initial position times the momentum over mass times t, undergraduate physics. And then you take into account the uncertainty principle. So now it's h bar here, here h bar was taken to 1. And then if you write down the uncertainty of the coordinate, then you will have the uncertainty initial. And using this expression, you define the uncertainty of p. And then you get this function. And obviously, it has a minimum. And the minimum is this. So for a free mass, this is a standard quantum limit, which is simply defined by the time of the measurement, h bar, and the mass. And it's not very relevant what this is. It's just relevant that it's there. So the starting point of this talk is that, look, apparently, according to quantum mechanics, we are not allowed to trace the motion of this object with infinite accuracy. And the end of this talk will be, yes, we can. And quantum mechanics will be intact. We just need to think a little bit about the reference frame. Because all this discussion didn't say anything about the reference frame. You know, it's the absolute x, the absolute momentum, and uh, life is good. So the three steps to the noiseless quantum trajectories, and there are some incomplete list of references here. So number one. Define the trajectory of motion relative to a quantum reference frame. And this reference frame should have an effective negative mass, whatever it is. There are different incarnations for the effective negative mass. And I will give you one example, and you'll see that it's really not that futuristic. And finally, you should generate an entangled state between the reference frame and the probe system. So if you follow those three steps, you will be able to trace the motion in this reference frame, in principle, with arbitrary accuracy. So this is the slide after which you can hibernate, because essentially it's just the, the essence of the story. So we know that there exists a so-called einstein podolsky rosen entangled state, which means that if I take two systems, the system of interest, x and p, and another system, reference system, let's say, x0 and p0, then the sum of the position, the momenta, and the difference of the position, those two operators commute. You can write it up very easily. Because of this minus, you will see that the commutator is 0. If the commutator is 0, that means that this quantity and this quantity can be measured with arbitrary accuracy. And this is an entangled state, which Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen talked about in 1935 and stated that quantum mechanics cannot be complete. Why? Because if I have a particle on planet Mars with x and p 
variables. And you have another particle on planet Earth with x naught and p naught variables. And if they are entangled, meaning that this is known exactly and this is known exactly, then you can choose on planet Earth either to measure the position of your particle. And then you immediately know the position of my particle, God knows where. Or you can decide, no, I don't want to measure x. I want to measure p naught. And then you immediately and non-destructively know the momentum of my particle. So this paradox, Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen called spooky action at a distance. Ooh. And they argued that the world cannot be like that. You cannot define the state of a particle, God knows where, by your free will choosing which object, or which um, quantity of the state to measure. Well, turns out that insofar as we understand life, they were wrong. And our kind of best vision of that, my best vision of that, is that the wave function has no limits. It can be as large as the universe. And uh, this wave function defines the common property, and that's how it is. Um, but this is just the start for us, right? So we assume that we can have such an entangled state. And now this is the high school algebra. So we want to measure the position of our object with respect in the reference frame corresponding to another object. So what is it? It's the initial relative position. You can think of it as the difference between x naught and x naught of 0, plus the difference of the derivatives times time. Any questions asked here? No. This is indeed the ninth grade, right? And then we proceed. Of course, let's take the mass to be equal to, z to 1, and then x dot is p, and this one is p naught. And why do I have a plus here? I have a plus here because I assumed that the mass of my reference frame is minus 1 and not 1. And if I assume that, then I have my trajectory defined with commuting variables, the difference of x's and the sum of p's. So that's the gist of it. If you can find a reference frame with an effective negative mass, then you take this reference frame and the object of interest. You make a measurement of the sum of the, oops, sorry. The sum of the position and the difference of the momentum, you are allowed to do it. And then when you come a moment later and you repeat this measurement, you are again allowed to do it. If you get something different in this sum and in this difference, then you measured the incremental motion. And you measured the incremental motion because you know both this and this, and therefore you know the trajectory. So you can continue doing that step by step in time, and you will be measuring the trajectory in principle with arbitrary accuracy. The same story goes for an oscillator. We will be in the first part of this talk dealing with an oscillator. So for an oscillator, obviously, the position can be written as x times cosine and p times sine. And again, the negative mass actually in this case is equivalent to the negative frequency. And uh, if I take the frequency of my reference oscillator to be negative, then this sine here will be minus sine, and this minus will be changed into a plus. And uh, once again, the condition for the entanglement in the continuous variable um, domain it's another interesting story, actually. 
the Einstein product of chaos and entanglement was discussed in 1935. And they simply talked about it qualitatively. It took 65 years until 2000, the year 2000, when two groups, uh, Sirak and Zoller, and uh, I forgot the other author, uh, they actually derived the necessary and sufficient condition for this entanglement. And you can understand it very easily, I think, because the entanglement condition is that the variance of this difference and the variance of this sum should be known well. What does it mean well? Less than two. Why two? Why not pi square over four? Well, because if you take the minimal uncertainty state, the vacuum state or coherent state, then all those four variances for two independent systems in the minimal uncertainty state will be simply equal to one half. And you can break it into the sum of the variances. You'll have one half, one half, one half, and one half. And there will be two. And if it's less than two, then there are quantum correlations, which are called entanglement. So essentially, you can make a connection between the entanglement condition and this measurement in the negative reference frame beyond quantum limits. So, we take a deep breath, and uh, I introduce the negative mass reference oscillator. For those of you who are familiar with spins and atomic physics, this will be hopefully easy to understand. So, let me assume that I have an ensemble of spins. And uh, let's say those are spin one-halves. I put them in the magnetic field. There is a splitting of the energy levels. And let me assume that I first orient all the spins up. So here we have all the spins up on top of each other. This is the so-called block sphere, which defines three projections of the spin. So in our case, this projection, JZ, is large and classical. I write down the commutator for the projections of the large spin. And notice that I remove the hat from this projection because it's large and classical. In my experiments, there will be like 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 12 of those spins. So it's really a large and classical number. And at that point, I would like to make a small disclaimer. Alex is not here, but he knows my opinion. He talked yesterday about quantum mechanics, which after the first quantum revolution was applied to things like transistors and so on. And those were macroscopic objects. And then he kind of made a distinction between that period of time when we talked about macroscopic objects and nowadays when we're talking about microscopic objects. And this is the difference between the first and the second quantum revolution. I cannot disagree more. I think the difference is in quantum superpositions and entanglement versus essentially calculating energy levels. So we've been calculating energy levels for 80 years. And now we started thinking about quantum superpositions and entanglement. This is what defines the second quantum revolution, not the size of the object. The size of my objects, you will see it. You can, you can observe it with the naked eye. Anyways, so the spin and the two components, which are orthogonal to the macroscopic spin direction, they are sort of like a little uncertainty blob. Again, what's the origin of this uncertainty blob? Of course, it comes from the commutation relation. And if you derive the uncertainty principle from this commutation relation, you'll simply see that the uncertainty in the x and y projections will be of the order of square root of the number of particles, which in some sense is an obvious story. Because if one spin is oriented up, then if you look at its projection on any orthogonal axis, it will be random plus minus 1 half. Each of them will 
give you a random plus minus one half result, and you add plus minus one half Poissonian distribution, you'll get a square root of the number of particles. It's just like flipping a coin. So this uncertainty, which is the minimal uncertainty state for this large spin, you can say it's a ground spin, ground state of the spin where you don't have any collective excitations here, that's this. Now, what should happen in this picture if I create the first excited state of this thing? Yeah, so this is just, I want to zoom into the north pole of this block sphere, and then of course it's equivalent to x and p. Why is that? Because I can divide this commutator by jz, and then on the right hand side I have i, and if I have an i on the right hand side, then those two objects renormalized jx and jy are just equivalent to x and p. So this is the story of the collective atomic spin playing the role of an oscillator. Where is the oscillator? Well, the oscillator will come in a second, but first, if I make the first excited state, then it will be like the first excited state of an oscillator, like the first Fox state. And now, think of this sphere. It's large, but it has a finite radius. And you started with a ground state, and then you created a state which is slightly bigger, right? So this one is slightly bigger than the initial state. You can imagine that if it's slightly bigger, then it's slightly closer to the south pole, right? Boom, 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 boom. So the first excited state of this oscillator is closer to the south pole than its ground state, which means that it has lower energy. So the first excited state of an oscillator has a lower energy. That can be cast in the language of the negative mass or negative frequency. So that's the whole story. You take an atomic ensemble of spins, you orient it first, all like that, and then you deal with those collective excitations and whatever excited state, a squeeze state or an entangled state or whatever, any state that is different from the ground state of this inverted oscillator will have the energy which is lower than the ground state, which means that it can be discussed as the negative mass oscillator. And now you put everything in this magnetic field, and all this stuff begins to oscillate at the Larmor frequency, and now you have an oscillator with a negative mass. Can I ask you yes, so sure. How do you, how do you in the first place? Uh, with light. With, with light. So but well, we'll Exactly, well, we will get to that, but essentially what you do is you shine sigma plus uh, polarized light and then eventually get them all. It's a very good question. Um, it's more than that. Because the negative temperature, a laser is in a negative temperature kind of state. What is extremely important here is that this excitation is a collective excitation. It's not like one of the spins is flipped. It's a superposition of all spins contributing to this spin flip. So it's terribly important that when you generate such a state, you don't know the which way information. You don't know which spin you flipped. And this is very different from a laser. So uh, yeah, we can talk about it. Right. So this is actually the thing in the lab. So it's this little glass cell, one centimeter, a few centimeters in length. And in this little channel, there are 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9, 10 to the 12 cesium atoms, which are kind of flying around. It's all at room temperature or even higher. And th there are tricks, like we want to conserve the entanglement of those spins, the non-classical state of those spins. How do you do it if they collide with the walls? Well, there are some magic coatings, which I don't have time to talk about, but those walls are coated 
in such a way that those spins can experience 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth collisions and keep their entangled state, which is pretty amazing, but that's the fact of life. So then you shine light along this channel and you do all your operations. This is the cartoon of the entire experiment. So here we have our little cell with uh, 10 to the 8 spins, which play the role of the negative mass oscillator in this magnetic field. Light goes through them, and then it goes through the mechanical object whose trajectory we want to observe in the reference frame of this spin. So think about it in the following way. Here is the spin oscillating in the magnetic field. Here is the membrane oscillating at, at its drum frequency. You want to make a measurement which would synchronize those two motions to better than the quantum limit allows you, and you can do it. Right. So this you have already seen, and uh, this is our amazing mechanical oscillators. So what you see here is um, a silicon frame and in the middle there is the so-called phononic band gap structure of those holes which support this oscillator in the middle which has the size of maybe 300 microns, sometimes it's half a millimeter. It's really a thing you can see. It's very thin. It's 100 nanometers thin, but you can absolutely see it. Easily breakable, but still can survive ambient situation. So this little thing, isolated from the environment with this phononic band gap structure, has an amazing quality factor. And this is very important because it's essentially, well, it's not at room temperature, but it's at 7 Kelvin. And 7 Kelvin to me is sort of like a room temperature. <laughs> yeah, I used to say we don't do drugs, we don't do cryogenics. Now I say we don't do drugs, we don't do dilution refrigerators. So 7 Kelvin is just nothing. So um, this thing is put in the machine, and those are the heroes in the lab, and let's just see what happens there. So the first half of the experiment is this uh, atomic ensemble. So I told you already about those atoms which are sitting in this channel, and this little thing is sitting inside this triple magnetic shield, because you can imagine that this spin has the ground state uncertainty of 1 over square root of n in the angle, right? So the uncertainty here is square root of n, this is n, so the angular uncertainty is 1 over square root of n. And n is 10 to the 8 particles, roughly. So it's 10 to minus 4, the size of the ground state of the spin fluctuations. Any magnetic field can kill this thing, so we really need to be extremely careful with everything. And uh, all the optical elements around, and uh, let's forget about this. Okay, so the first thing we need to understand is that we are in the quantum regime with both systems. One system is the spins, the other system is the mechanical oscillator. We first want to observe the quantum back action. Remember I told you that if you continuously monitor the oscillator, you just pile more and more back action on it. How does it work here? So, we make a measurement with the polarized light, and here we have our spins. They are oriented, sort of classically speaking, along this axis, but there is a quantum uncertainty here, and this quantum uncertainty is precessing in the magnetic field. You send light in linear polarization, and if you remember what happens with polarized light when it goes through a spin, then the polarization changes. It's the Faraday effect. So if the spin is pointing this direction, the polarization changes clockwise. If the spin is pointing this direction, 
it changes counterclockwise. If it's oscillating, the polarization oscillates. And the polarization oscillation is relatively easy to observe experimentally, and that's what we do. So we read out the quantum state of this large atomic spin, and at the same time, we disturb it by the quantum back action. Because as we are measuring this projection, we are putting the back action in the orthogonal projection. And we want to see this back action. And uh, there is a cosine and sine of this oscillation. Cosine gives you the x in the rotating frame. Sine gives you p in the rotating frame, plus the back action noise. It's this back action noise that we want to get rid of. And this is what we observe experimentally. Indeed, that would be the hypothetical ground state of the spin. And this is what we observe. And this whole pile is the quantum back action. It took us three years to get to this point. It's not trivial to see this that much of back action, but it's possible. So with this oscillator, we're in a good shape. We're dominated by the back action which means that there is something to cancel. And here is our mechanical object, the second oscillator, rather the first oscillator. So I've shown you already those membranes. They're sitting in this crest at very good optical axis. And in fact, this membrane is sitting in the middle of the optical resonator. So what happens here? You shine light into this optical resonator, and the membrane moves. Why does it move? Well, because it's a finite temperature. It's a drum at a finite temperature. Under graduate physics, it moves. It moves, and the amplitude of motion is proportional to the square root of the temperature. Moreover, even if you would be able to cool it down to its absolute ground state, as we all remember, there will be h bar omega over 2, the ground state fluctuations. And this is what we see in the experiment with this really macroscopic object. We see the ground state oscillations, and we see the back action. Where does the back action come from? If you shine light on this system, you can think of light as a wave and as a stream of particles. Because it's a wave, Depending on the position of this membrane, there will be a different resonant condition in this resonator. It's a standing wave. And you take a piece of dielectric and begin to move in this standing wave. Of course, the index of refraction changes. So due to the wave properties, you can measure the position of this membrane. But light is at the same time a stream of photons. And those photons, they're like the machine gun bullets. They bombard this membrane, and they disturb it. And this is the mechanism of the quantum back action. So because of this wave-particle duality, you have the ability to measure the position of the mechanical object, and you disturb it necessarily. You can think of it in the language of the frequencies. So if this is the resonant, optical resonance of this cavity, and if I shine light with this frequency, and if there is something vibrating here, then due to those vibrations, this light will acquire sidebands at the frequency of vibrations, like a modulator. There will be a blue sideband and a red sideband. In other words, this light can be scattered into a higher energy or into a lower energy. And now, this is the pretty much fundamental two-mode Hamiltonian in the, um, well, in the linear domain in, all, in, in both systems. So what you can have here is, again, the membrane moves, and if you tune your laser above the resonance of the cavity. Then obviously, this sideband will be on resonance with the cavity, and this one won't. 
So scattering into here will be more probable. Now, if you scatter a photon from here to here, you create a photon, a dagger. But you have lost the energy. This energy went where? To the phonon. So if you turn it like that, then you have the creation of a photon and the creation of a phonon. And this is an entanglement Hamiltonian, just like that. If you turn it on the other side, then scattering happens into the blue photon. That means that you have to take away the energy from the system, which means that you are annihilating the phonon. And this is the so-called beam splitter interaction. This type of interaction takes energy from the mechanics, annihilates a phonon, and puts it into light. But light at those frequencies is an infinite bucket of coldness. Because light, fluctu you know, fluctuations of light can be easily made ground state limited. Light in a coherent state has no fluctuations at one megahertz. Therefore, shining light through the system, you simply cool the membrane if you do it in this way. And you can cool it actually to the ground state of motion, and this has been demonstrated. Yes? The, the tuning is given by the pumping rate, or? The detuning is simply given by the frequency of the laser. Oh, between the, the side bands and the... Oh, the detuning, the, so there is a detuning of the laser with respect to the cavity. This is just changing the laser. And this splitting is the frequency of motion of the membrane, which is about one and a half megahertz an hour story. Yeah, let me skip this. So, long and behold, we put this membrane into this system, and again, we make a measurement of its motion. And if we make a measurement with a very weak light, extremely weak, then we see something like this bump, which is close to the ground state of oscillations. And if we crank up the light power, then we begin to see this huge pile of the quantum back action. So those are two benchmarks. We observe the quantum back action of light on the atoms. We observe the quantum back action of light on the mechanical system. We can have the mechanical system in the effective negative mass frame. And now we can demonstrate the entangled state of those two objects. And uh, I will have to speed up a little bit, so we will probably just jump to the results. So this is just the schematic of the experiment. You have light, you send it through the atomic ensemble, and then you add some other driving field, you send it through the mechanical system, and you detect. Yeah, this is the slide for which I never have the time. So it's just to tell you that the experiment is complex. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Sorry. So this is the another milestone uh, result. So what you see here in yellow is the noise of the mechanical motion which is dominated by the quantum back action of light. And now you turn on the atoms, and what you see, which we call the hybrid, is significantly, like a factor of two, smaller back action area than for the mechanics alone. So it's kind of funny, right? You have a mechanical system, then you add to the story another quantum system with its own quantum noise, and the result is the negative interfere, destructive interference of those quantum back actions. And this is precisely the demonstration of this measurement in the negative mass reference frame that I started with. 
Yes. So this was the initial attempt to do so with some marginal success, which we published two years ago, I think. Yes. And now we're well on the way to demonstrate entanglement. So I repeat my mantra. We need to define the trajectory relative to a quantum reference. This is done. We need to have the reference system with an effective mass, this atomic spin oscillator. This is done. And now we need to demonstrate the entangled state. And we're kind of well on the way towards that. I'm not ready to claim that we have seen entanglement, although I believe we have. But it's not published yet, so I'm very cautious. And the experiments are running as we speak. Um, oh, I don't know how much of technical details I want to go into. Uh, for those who are interested, you can ask me. But definitely, there is some intricate analysis of the noise, the so-called Wiener fil filtering. And uh, we need to be careful in what we're measuring. Let me show you something else. Yes. So how to visualize this whole story? So we have two oscillators, and each of them can be presented in the phase space x and p. And the mechanical oscillator is initially in its thermal state. It can be close to the ground state, but it doesn't have to. And so this is the big size of the thermal state. And here is the spin oscillator, which is typically near the ground state. And now we want to generate an entangled state. And an entangled state would mean that the motion in this phase space and in this space, phase space are strictly coordinated. They are just very well entangled and synchronized. So this thing goes around like crazy because it's temperature. But if now you freeze this time for the time which is shorter than thermal decoherence. And for us, this time is relatively long. You know, 0.3 milliseconds by quantum standards, that's a lot. So at that point, you can forget about thermal motion. Now, we have a location of the mechanical oscillator in phase space and the location of the spin oscillator. And those pale pink large things correspond to the back action. So this is the back action of measurement on one oscillator. This is on the other. And to visualize the entangled state, you have to just believe me, rather not believe me, I've shown you the results, that the composite state of those two systems is a superposition of all possible synchronized states of the two oscillators. So if that one is here, then that one is here. If that one is here, then that one is here. Where is it? You will only know when you measure. So and now I will try my best to show you our wonderful animation. If it works, I'm not sure that it will work. Yes, it does. So what you see here is actually the experimental realization. And you see here that the two trajectories of the two oscillators are really close to each other, which means that essentially, indeed, they follow each other with the accuracy, which is better than uh, the standard quantum limit shown in the middle with this uh, large pink thing. And uh, I hope it will stop at some stage. Stop. Thank you. And uh, you may want to ask me why everything is in the left side of the diagram. And the answer is, I don't know. This is, <laughs> this is truly the random realization. So this is why you can win the lottery more than once. OK. So in the last 10 minutes or so, 
What does it have to do with one of the most daunting quests of the humankind? Observation of gravitational waves. So on the one hand, you can say the Nobel Prize has already been given, so why bother? On the other hand, maybe there will be more prizes, so let's just keep trying. <laughs> so uh, this is what they observed uh, at LIGA three years ago, I think, something, yeah, February 2016. And uh, so apparently what happened was that somewhere, God knows where, there were binary stars which were merging, and as they were merging, they were just kind of merging into one, and this is the gravitational wave signal, which has the frequency range from relatively low to relatively high, and at that point, everything just collapsed into a black hole. So how does this observation work? There is an interferometer. It's a reasonably large interferometer. This arm is four kilometers, and this arm is four kilometers. There are two of those, one in Washington State and one in Louisiana. And those two objects, which I show here as my little membranes, they're, in fact, multi-kilogram suspended beautiful mirrors. And the gravitational wave is a quadrupole wave. So when it comes, it distorts space in a quadrupole fashion. It squeezes it that way, and anti-squeezes it that way, with the frequencies in more or less the audio range, from tens of hertz to a kilohertz. So it does this boom, 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 boom. And this mirror moves up, this mirror moves in, this mirror moves down, this mirror moves up. So the gravitational wave distorts space and unbalances this interferometer. And uh, you observe the signal. It took them 30 years to put this thing together and observe the first signal. Now they have many of those signals. Now there is a European um, Virgo experiment in, in uh, Italy. There is an experiment in Japan. and. Uh, This is what made me personally very excited. What is it? It's the sensitivity plot of those beautiful machines as a function of the frequency of oscillation of the mirrors. And why on earth does it look that way? Well, we're looking with light at the position of the mirrors. By now, after all I told you, you know that there are two things to watch. One is the back action of light. There, is a, there are hundreds of kilowatts of light circulating in this interferometer. And despite the fact that the mirrors are multi-kilogram, those photons bombard them and make them jitter. And the longer you look at it, the higher is the jitter. What does it mean, look longer? It means lower frequencies. So at lower frequencies, the sensitivity is limited by the radiation pressure of light, which is amazing. At higher frequencies, when you look quicker, you don't observe very accurately because you just don't look for long enough. And therefore, short noise of light makes your sensitivity worse again. So it's exactly the balance between the back action and the precision of measurement that we call the standard quantum limit in the beginning of this talk. And the minimum here is very close to the standard quantum limit which means that now we can come and say, we offer you guys a solution to go below this curve with our atomic negative mass reference frame. And this is the experiment that we're building now. 
And uh, this is just to say that there is, there is a lot of space, not only in the bottom, but also up there in the top. There is plenty to be observed and uh, interesting stuff. Um, one thing that I want to mention here is that, yeah, sure, quantum technologies, yes, let's make better phones, better, I don't know, dishwashers, uh, better GPSs. But come on, I mean, in most countries, well, most, not most, but at least in this country, in my countries, people live not so bad lives. So we should think of something really grand. This is really grand. And this is what science is good for, I think. You take kids off the streets and you put them and do those experiments. This is our goal in life. <laughs> take kids off the streets and put them to do physics or biology or medicine or whatnot. Okay? So I think it's a very wonderful goal. I told you about this standard quantum limit already. We know that it exists. And here I've shown you that the gravitational wave detectors are close to it. And then the simple plan ha, 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 is to take the system in the heart of which is this atomic ensemble and make a joint measurement on the light coming from this interferometer and the atomic oscillator. The atomic oscillator will have to be shifted to lower frequencies, of course, because the frequencies here are really low. And uh, another, so this is our magic cell. Of course, it has to be surrounded with like three square meters of apparatus, but still, you know, it's, it's something really manageable, which we hope to build to show that it works and then to convince the gravitational wave people that they may want to put our little breadboard nearby. Um, again, an extremely simple arithmetic. I want to make a joint measurement on the interferometer and on my atomic X. And you already know that X is this spin projection. And if the mass is negative, then I can have my stuff because it will only involve commuting variables. Yeah, I want to acknowledge my wonderful collaborator, Farid Halili, from Moscow State University. Farid has been instrumental in many generations of gravitational wave detection. And uh, I managed to get him interested in this quantum noise eater, so we're working on it together. Yeah, let me forget about this. So the only thing that I want to mention here is that the experiment that I told you about was like that. You take light, you send it through atoms, you send it through mechanics, you make a measurement. And the core was that light imposes quantum back action on both systems, and then they cancel out. But for that, you need the same light to go through the two systems. Unfortunately, with a gravitational wave crowd, this is not possible. Because they stick to their wavelength, which is their lasers, which they've been building for 30 years. It's 106 micron, and they're non-negotiable. Cesium atoms with which we work is also non-negotiable. It's 850 nanometers. So you cannot send the same light to the disentanglement through the two systems. And then, of course, the solution is that you just use entangled light. You generate an entanglement between this color and this color. And then you send this color through your spins, this color through the gravitational wave detection, and you get the same results because you have now entangled light in the imprecision and entangled light in the back action. So same difference. Never mind that. Never mind even this. So those are the heroes of this experiment. There are more of them now, but there were two of them a few months ago. And uh, this is the breadboard on which they built the entangled source of light. 
and the atomic noise eater. And when this thing is complete and hopefully works, we will start selling the idea to the gravitational wave community. And this is what we have on paper. This is the sensitivity without us. This is where they are now. And this is what we hope to deliver. It's about a factor of two better. And note that it's better across the entire range. So we are indeed pushing the sensitivity down beyond the standard quantum limit in the broadband. And this is only possible if you do this kind of tricks, because it is the measurement beyond the standard quantum limit. And if it's a factor of two, that simply means that the volume of the universe that you can actually observe grows by the factor of what? Do I have attention? Can't believe it. If the sensitivity grows by a factor of two, the volume of the universe grows by the factor of. Say something. Yes, think, 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 think. Yes, so there is actually a European installation, at least in the dreams, around Maastricht. And several European countries are conspiring to build the so-called Einstein telescope, which will be another gravitational wave detector with superior sensitivity. And uh, they are open to crazy suggestions, including ourselves. Thank you for your attention. experimental um, where you took that data um, of the two oscillators. Yes. Um, and you mentioned that we saw that the data is mainly on the left hand side of, of, of this diagram. I'm trying to get my head around that. The data is what? The data was uh, primarily on the left hand of, of the of the of the of the diagram. You know when you Oh when you this to, strange uh, this yeah. Point. No it's random. Well, did that data take? And if you retake it, would it then be even Absolutely, it will. Yes, okay. sure. it's, a disc it's, it's just one incarnation. Okay. It, it certainly will be symmetric. Oh, okay. And it is. Uh, I have a question. Oh, so I'm curious about negative mass. Yes. I'm a little bit confused from the terminology that yes. you're using. Mm -hmm. What you do is that you have basically spins in equilibrium you start from spins in equal distribution, and then you dynamically polarize them, and then you apply magnetic field. Right. So you polarize them, you make all the spins look up, you apply the magnetic field, and then you have this kind of, well, this is actually done simultaneously. So you apply the magnetic field, you optically pump, and then you make it like this. This is the starting point. So that's what the inverse population. It's the inverted population. So if it would be like that, that, then the first excited state will be bigger and higher I'm energy. I'm confused by the terminology that oh. actually it is, not, it is an inverted state. So the excited state, I mean, it is in, a, in the most excited state. It's it is in the most excited right, state. So that you kind of inverted to say that it's the ground state. Or something. Yes, so it's a ground state of noise. So I have a special slide for that. We can look through it if you're interested. But there is, a, there is a whole range of differences in terms of the inverted population, inverted energy, and the ground state. So the ground state of an oscillator, for me, is a state which has the minimal uncertainty, you know, x squared plus p squared minus 1 half is 0. And the reason I'm asking is that, you know, there was this very key things, completely related, unrelated things, yeah. that's negative. Yes. Zeta, yes. Yes. And you know, I I, I talked to this crowd, and in fact, people like Bob Altshuler tell me that there could be other incarnations for this negative mass. People get truly excited, but you know, I'm interested in something which I can build in the lab. Uh -huh. So, with this negative mass method, there is a absolutely no. Standard quantum limit in principle, you can get the perfect precision. Yes. So, 
<laughs> yeah. So any stuff of that kind is incredibly sensitive to losses. And uh, it's a complex experiment. My usual answer to that is, you give me 10% of the LIGA budget, I'll give you 10 dB of improvement. <laughs> it's, it's, it, no, it, it's, it's just losses, you know, just simply losses. You need to have pure states all over. And um, it's damn hard, you know, uh, buying the best possible components. And that's what we hope to get. Noise score is limited by decoherence, in a sense, uh, or the entanglement. Mm. Okay, so there are two things, right? Decoherence, it's a time process, right? So decoherence defines how long I have to do all that stuff, how long I can keep my entangled state. And I gave you an example of like a fraction of a millisecond. We can do a little better than that, but that's the, the level. And then the noise floor over this period of time. If I only look at one system, then the noise floor will be defined by the ground state noise and the back action. And if I look at two systems in a hybrid fashion, then I can go below. And if I wait for longer than then a millisecond doing nothing, then it will all blow up and the noise will be crazy because the environment will start feeding phonons into the mechanical system and just decohere it altogether. Um, is your result uh, valid in another way for spray? Excellent question, no. So this is like, there is a wonderful statement the entanglement monogamy. So if I'm entangled with my loved one, I cannot be entangled with another person. So two systems which are perfectly entangled cannot be entangled with anything else. There could be a tripartite entanglement, but then each pair of this tripartite entanglement will not be very well entangled. So in this respect, it's a relatively unique situation that you have to stick to the reference frame. But, yes? But don't you think the measurement should be objective? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it is an objective measurement. Everything, look, look every, I, I, will, I will blubber about it a little more in, in the evening. But essentially, you don't worry about relativity, do you? <laughs> Good. <laughs> well, at least you know you put me on equal footing with with Einstein in this respect. Of course, there are different reference frames, and in different reference frames, you have different results. So, you have this beautiful result in my reference frame. In any other reference frame, this mechanical motion will be completely chaotic. Mm -hmm. The law of nature looks very simple in not any reference frame, but only in national references. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So in this case, you stimulate the next question. So uh, the inertial frame reference frames are equal in your approach? This is a tricky question to which I would be happy to discuss the answer, because in some sense, you know, those are oscillators. So they're definitely, if you take this mechanical oscillator, for instance, in any static reference frame, of course it's not inertial, it moves with acceleration. And the, the mechanical spin is also moving with acceleration. So in this respect, they're both not inertial. Is it related to the effect that actually you apply electromagnetic uh, interaction? And of course, for that, you need uh, not a Galilean reference of frame, but uh, I don't believe that any kind of 
I'm the listener or anything like that is involved here. At least I didn't look at it. So I consider all interactions essentially instantaneous with light. So the, you know, our distance is a few meters. Well, okay, in LIGO it will be a few kilometers. It's still picoseconds, nanoseconds. So, you know, I am absolutely excited that people ask questions like that because maybe there will be some more deep insights into those things because, you know, I'm a humble experimentalist. I came up with this thing, I want to do my measurement and I want to kind of push the limits of quantum mechanics, if you will. But there might be some implications in relativity as well. I just, I'm not an expert. I'm not sure about the, the think about doing the same thing instead of negative mass, uh, imagine a sign. Say again? Instead of ne negative mass, interpreting this uh, with imagined sign. Uh, some of you, I like to uh, do the calculations for that. Mm. Um, so, maybe in this sense a negative time, because it's a negative frequency. So if you write down, you know, the frequency as omega square root of k over m, and both k and m are negative. So the frequency is actually real, but it's negative somehow. So uh, imaginary frequency, that's a slightly different story, and it pertains to uh, unstable oscillators, for example, then you will get the imaginary frequency. But in this case, I don't think that that is the case. <laughs>